Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I know God's powerful, but am I reading that right? Does that say that power is in us? In us? For us? Through us? To us? Oh my gosh, then why am I living such a weak, miserable life? Father, thank you for the word. I pray, Lord, that you would give us revelation, not just information. And we thank you that people love your word, they respect your word, and they're going to be attentive. And every person's going to get something that's going to change their life. Amen. The Apostle Paul prayed for the church in a way that we probably very seldom pray. We probably very seldom pray this for other people, and we probably very seldom pray it for ourselves. Maybe you do, but I know I certainly didn't for a lot of years, but I think it's very important that we take a look at the prayers of the Apostle Paul because he prayed for the church regularly, and, and he prayed some very interesting things. He prayed in Ephesians that they would have a revelation on God's love, uh, that they would be conscious and aware of the love of God and experience that love for themselves. There's nothing that's any more important to you than to know that you know that you know that God loves you unconditionally and that he will never not love you. Do you hear me? God will never not love you. <laughs> Amen. Come on now. I know there's a lot of people watching by television that you need a revelation of the love of God. God, there will never has never been and will never be a time in your life when God does not love you. Amen. And Paul prayed that they would learn to choose what was excellent. That would be good, wouldn't it? How many of you think our lives could get a whole lot better real quick if we just made better choices? Amen. And so, he, you know, he prayed a lot of wonderful things, and this is one of his wonderful prayers. He said, for I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he might grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, which is insight into mysteries and secrets, in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. So the first thing that Paul prays is that people would have wisdom, which wisdom is the right use of knowledge. I always say that wisdom is to do now what you're going to be happy with later on. A lot of wisdom is just common sense. Just plain common sense. And we have wisdom in us. The Bible says that Christ has made unto us wisdom. But nonetheless, we need to use that wisdom. And we need revelation. We don't need information. We need revelation. We don't need head knowledge. We need revelation. I really want to encourage you to start seeking God for revelation. And a lot of the people that you're trying to talk into stuff because you think you see things in their life that, boy, if you would just do this, or if you would just not do that, I can tell you that you're just going to wear yourself out trying to convince them because they probably don't even see what you see. But you could pray for them to have revelation. Because when God shows them, all of a sudden now, it's just like, oh, I get it. Now, I believe that anybody called of God to do what I'm doing should be doing it with a strong anointing. And that means that they should be doing it with the presence of God on their life and on their gift. Because where the anointing is, bondages are destroyed. So, in particular, as a Bible teacher... And all the years that I've gotten to do that in so many places around the world, I love to watch what happens on people's faces when they get it. <laughs> and sometimes it's something you've heard a hundred times, but you just didn't get it. Well, why? Well, you know. I don't know, maybe somebody was trying to tell you that didn't have much of an anointing. 
and they weren't able to break through that bullheadedness and get it into your heart. I, I, don't, I don't know why. Maybe you weren't really listening. Maybe you weren't ready, but there is a difference in information and revelation. And we in the church today in our society, we are educated so far beyond our level of obedience <laughs> that it is just unbelievable. How many more Bible studies are you going to have to go to <laughs> on forgiveness <laughs> before you just, I mean practically before somebody can offend you, you've already forgiven them <laughs> because you understand the dangers of offense. How many more Bible studies are we going to have to go to before we no longer will mess around with being jealous? Are competing, are comparing ourselves. Or for that matter, how many more Bible studies will you have to go to? How many more sermons will you have to hear before you finally make the decision you will never waste one more day of your life wallowing around in guilt? So there's no, you know, I don't need to bring you information. Now, maybe there's some here that haven't heard much, and so you need some information, but no matter how much information you get, if it never turns into revelation, it's not going to do you any good. Head knowledge, the Bible says, makes us proud and haughty. Amen? And I know many of you, like me, your Bible looks like a coloring book. I mean, you've got everything underlined and... And then we do yellow, and then we do red, and, you know, we do stars, and then we get a pink marker, and we do pink, and, you know, but you can turn your Bible into a coloring book. That doesn't mean you know anything. It only means you know how to underline in different colors. <laughs> so when I say tonight to turn here or there, and you open your Bible up, and the passage that I'm going to talk about, you've got all underlined and colored in. Please don't hope the person next to you sees <laughs> how brilliant you are. <laughs> oh, come on now. I know. I mean, I've sat in church, opened my Bible up. It was all colored in. And I've, I mean, I can honestly tell you that I remember thinking, oh, I, I hope they see what I know. <laughs> come on. So sometimes knowledge can just puff us up. And actually can be deceiving because we think because we've heard it and have it underlined that we know it, but we don't know anything that we're not doing on a regular basis. <laughs> Amen? And so I'm not here to bring you information. The Bible says in Mark chapter 4, the measure of thought and study that you give to the truth that you hear is the measure of virtue and knowledge, virtuous power, that will come back to you. So even sitting in a pew and having somebody spoon feed you the Word of God, even turning your television set on every morning right away and watching Joyce Meyer. <laughs> I see you out there. And I'm glad that you watch my program. I'm so glad that I can help you and have input into your life. You, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but please get a hold of at least one thing that I say today. Make it a goal that every day you're going to get a hold of at least one thing, and you're going to take that thing and you're going to meditate that on that today. And you're going to confess it out loud. Joyce reminded me this morning that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm right with God. God loves me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Don't be one of those people that's, that somebody can say, oh, did you watch Joyce this morning? Yeah, what'd she say? I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> now, you know as well as I do, half of the time when you leave church, by lunch, you could not tell anybody what the pastor even talked about. <laughs> then we wonder why we don't have any victory. Well, I go to church. 
And furthermore, I'll tell you that you can buy every CD I've got and every DVD and every book and you can get the most massive spiritual library that is so impressive. <laughs> but they don't help you at all unless you're going to listen to them. Probably over and over and over and over and over again. I had one guy tell me that he read Battlefield of the Mind 100 times. And he said, let me tell you, one day I got it. <laughs> so I think we just need to be a little bit more determined that if there is a victorious life to be had, that we are going to have it. And that we're not going to be passive. And we're not going to expect somebody else to do it all for us. That we're going to thank God for the teachers and thank God for the books and thank God for the DVDs and the CDs and all the wonderful stuff that you can get on the internet today. And thank God for our churches and our pastors. But you've got to meditate, which means to roll this stuff over and over in your mind to make this real to you. Now, Paul didn't say, I pray that you would know about God. He said, I want you to know God. I want you to know God. There was a time when Job said that at one time he knew about God. But he said, now mine eye has seen you and I know you. There's a whole difference in knowing about and knowing. Then Paul went on and he said, verse 18, by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope that he has called you to. My goodness, hope should be a habit in our lives. We should be addicted to hope. No more of this negative, you know, just sad, discouraged, gloomy, pitiful, pathetic attitude. My goodness, you are a child of God, the home of God, full of the Holy Ghost. There are so many promises in the Word of God that are yours that you just ought to be so excited about yourself you can hardly stand it. Paul said, I want you to know and understand the hope of your calling. And what your inheritance is. You're a joint heir with Christ. A co-inheritor. Everything he earned, you get. Sometimes I think of how hard I'm working. And what my kids are going to get. And I'm just like, hmm. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You know, we love our kids and we want to be a blessing to them. But you know, when you think about it, it just seems a little unreasonable that somebody does all the work and then somebody else just gets it. But that's what Jesus has done for us. He paid the price. Now we're forgiven. Totally set free from the power of sin. Last thing Paul prayed here is, and also so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us. <laughs> in and for us. In and for us. Wait a minute. You mean that I have unlimited, immeasurable, Pa I, wait, I know God's powerful, but am I reading that right? Does that say that power is in us? Yeah. In us? Yeah. For us? Yeah. Through us? To us? Yeah. Oh my gosh, then why am I living such a weak, miserable life? <laughs> because we don't have a revelation. <laughs> Got to have revelation. Now, revelation is a whole other thing than information. When you get revelation, it is something that cannot be taken away from you by any circumstance. 
you understand that? See, we let our circumstances take the word of God away from us. If my circumstance doesn't line up with the promise, then I think somehow there's something wrong and I read it wrong or it's not for me or it's never going to happen for me or, you know, whatever. But when you know that you know that you know that you know that you know, I mean, everything that Job went through and he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know that he will raise me up on that last day. I know. And Paul said, I want you to know. And that's what I want for you. And for all of our precious people that watch by television, I want you to know. I want you to know in India, and I want you to know in Africa, and I want you to know in Asia, and I want you to know in Papua New Guinea, and I want you to know everywhere where this broadcast is being translated into your language. If you're in a village in Africa, or you're in a village in India, and you feel like God has forgotten you, I want you to know that God loves you, and you have an inheritance and you can have hope. Hope can become a habit in your life. And God is real. And you can know him in a very personal, personal way. By revelation. We can have a revelation. How many of you think that's good to have a revelation? Amen? All right. John 14, 17. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, <laughs> cannot welcome or take to its heart because it does not see him or know and recognize him. <laughs> no wonder Jesus and Stephen prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Don't ever get mad at somebody who's not a believer when they don't get you. Because to you, to them, you are just as weird. It is like you are from a totally different planet. <laughs> and actually, the truth is, you are. <laughs> I mean, after all, the Bible says we are just passing through. <laughs> but Jesus gets you. John 15, verse 18. See, this is going to help you not to get all bent out of shape the next time your relatives don't get you. <laughs> you don't need to spend Thanksgiving trying to convince them. Just eat your turkey, be happy, and go home. <laughs> I mean, if God opens a door for you to witness, then do so with a sweet spirit. But listen to me, the minute the arguing starts, get out of it. Because all it is is the devil just trying to start something, get you to get good and mad, and misbehave, so they can go home and then say, see, see. <laughs> if the world hates you, just know that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would treat you with affection. <laughs> they would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, no longer one with it, but I have chosen you out of the world, the world hates you. <laughs> Can you get that? <laughs> oh, well. So much for total acceptance by everybody. <laughs> Remember that I told you a servant is not greater than his master, is not superior to him. If they persecuted me, Jesus said, they will persecute you. Now, I could go on and read you some other scriptures about persecution, but you wouldn't like it. It wouldn't cheer you up. But... The truth of the matter is, and I mean honestly, there's even a place in the Bible that says, woe be unto you if everybody is saying good things about you. <laughs> or something like that, some version of that. But the bottom line is, is we should be more concerned if we're not getting a little persecution from the world than it probably if everybody likes you in the world, I'm talking about among the unbelievers, and God can give you favor even with your enemies, but if everybody out there likes you, then you probably are compromising and just kind of going along because the Bible says you will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Amen? Moving on. So we need to make sure that we understand that 
God has given all of us a measure of revelation, but a person who is, does not have that relationship with God does not and cannot understand it. So even when you're around them, you might as well not even try to be super religious because they are just going to think you're a fruitcake. <laughs> try to meet them where they're at without compromising and becoming like them, okay? John 17, 3, and I love this. This is eternal life that we may know God. <laughs> wow. You know what I think hell's going to be? It's my own opinion. I mean, I know about the weeping and gnashing and, you know, the fire and the brimstone and all that that's in the Bible. But I think that hell is going to be complete separation from God. Because you see, even everybody that ever lives in the world, you still have God's influence. Because the Holy Spirit's here in the earth. What in the world would it be like to have total, complete separation from God? I think that's probably going to be what hell's like. This is eternal life that we may know God. As young believers, we may say that we know God. Oh, I know God. I know God. Yet we often need the support of our mind and our feelings to keep us pressing forward. If we don't feel warm and joyful, we think God's left us. If we encounter a trial or a tribulation, we wonder if God loves us or, once again, if he's left us. Where are you, God? Don't you love me anymore, God? If God delays an answer to our prayer, we begin to wonder where he is and why he's not working. <laughs> if our friends have things that we do not have, we question God and act as if he owes us an answer for his actions. But as we mature and receive more and more revelation, everybody say revelation. revelation, we progress to a place where we no longer need anything in the mental seeing or feeling realm to convince us that God is. It doesn't mean we don't enjoy it. Hey, I like a confirmation just like everybody else does. I like the feeling, I like the special word, but I can say with all sincerity, Sometimes the more mature you become in God, the less of that you get. <laughs> and sometimes you wonder, it's like, well, you know. I mean, I used to be able to just open my Bible when I was in trouble and, God, I need a word from you, God, God. <laughs> and I would, and I would get some of the most amazing stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you, God would speak to me. But then as I got a little older in God, and it was time for me to grow up a little bit, you know, God will make you let go of some of your props. And if you won't let them go, he'll kick them out from under you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And then I'm like, oh, God, I need you. God. <laughs> Woe be unto you, you wicked sinner. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Amen. I want to really encourage you to begin to pray on a regular basis for a revelation knowledge of God. Now, you know, it's one thing to know about God. It's another thing entirely to know God. That takes time, and I think it also takes having some experience with God, getting to know His character. It's one thing to have somebody tell you God is faithful. It's another thing entirely to experience the faithfulness of God in your life. And you know, when you really do know God, and you know that you can trust Him, you know that you can depend on Him, and you know that even if you don't understand what He's doing, that He's doing what He's doing because He loves you and because He has some end result in mind that's going to be wonderful, then it gives you courage and it gives you confidence.
insurgency have gone around Iraq, persecuting Christians, forcing them to leave their villages, their homes, their businesses. Many of those families have seen their children abducted, their husbands being killed right there in front of them. The Iraqi Christians are persecuted intentionally in Iraq. So all the families are leaving. The majority has come to Lebanon because they feel safe, because there's a big Christian community. When we looked around uh, and uh, saw the need uh, of the Iraqis, we felt the Lord is leading us to the target this group of people for the love and compassion we can provide. Hand of Hope was the first ministry to come alongside with us. Hand of Hope said, well, we want to be the hand of Jesus to the broken world of Lebanon. In a children's program, when kids come and learn about Jesus and go back home and they sing what they have learned, the worship songs, the families, they start asking questions. Why are kids so happy and joyful again? Why do they have their smiles back again? Because in Iraq, the kids stayed home 24-7. They're not allowed to leave home, to play, to have fun, because they're scared of car bombing, of kidnapping uh, for ransom. So here they're finding their joy again, and it's exciting for us. Joyce Meyer makes this happen. Uh, Joyce Meyer uh, supports the Heart for Lebanon Iraqi project. So all the food we buy, uh, if it was the snacks, the lunch, the trips we do, the camps, the retreats, all of that, and alone we cannot do it because it's a big burden and it's high expense. And uh, they want to help us bless the Iraqi refugees by that. So we feel cared and loved by that as well. Well, you certainly don't have to look very hard these days to find things to worry about. If you turn on the news for even five minutes, you can feel like the world is just spinning out of control. That's why I'm so excited about my new devotional, Trusting God Day by Day. These devotions will help you change your focus from your circumstances to the truth that's in God's Word. You know, it's time for us to enter into the peace that God has made available to us where we can enjoy our lives. And that comes only from trusting God day by day. Begin je dag met God met de 365 overdenkingen voor het hele jaar. Bestel het boek God Vertrouwen van dag tot dag nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.